Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the SIPL seminar for the Easter term. I'm delighted uh, to say that we have uh, with us this afternoon, Ashton Chantrell, who is a barrister at uh, 8 News Square. So for those of you who don't know, there are four main sets of IP chambers in London. Um, eight New Square, five New Square, Hogarth, three New Square, and 11 South Square. And um, eight New Square is certainly uh, regarded by most people as the best or close to being the best of those four sets of chambers. Ashton did her degree. She has a BSc from the University of Bristol in chemistry and law and was called to bar in uh, 2011. Ashton has been involved in lots of very interesting cases. And tonight she's going to talk about one of them, uh, Kogan against Martin. And um, I, won't, I won't bother to say anything about it apart from that it's about, and perhaps is revolutionary in relation to the law relating to joint authorship of copyright protected works. So Ashton, thank you. Thank you, Lionel. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming to listen to me today. It's a sunny day, so uh, I'm sure some of you would rather be um, catching the last rays of sun. Um, so I I'm going to be talking about the Kogan and Martin case that I was involved in for about five years now since it started. Um, and um, I'll be looking at it from, obviously, the factual perspective. I'll explain the, the interesting facts of the case, but also the procedural um, uh, lessons that were learned throughout the, the five years of, of, of working on the case. Um, so what I'll do is I'll take you through the case from start to finish chronologically, setting out some of the lessons that we learned along the way, um, and we'll um, uh, finish off with what to me was the most important um, uh, part of the case, which relates to how evidence is dealt with in, in he said, she said type cases. Um, and, and we'll finish off, obviously, with a, a, a Q&A. So uh, I, I don't know how many of you uh, are familiar with the case, but I'll give you a little introduction into it. The case concerned a dispute over the authorship of the screenplay of Florence Foster Jenkins, which was a film about a wealthy American socialite who um, uh, deludedly believed herself to be a uh, talented opera singer. Um, for those of you who have seen the film, it's quite obvious that she wasn't a talented opera singer. Um, it's quite funny, um, and it is uh, largely based uh, it, uh, around uh, opera and music and um, the uh, funny elements uh, deriving out of uh, Meryl Streep singing really badly. Um, now, you may be aware there was Hugh Grant, Meryl Streep uh, in the film, none of uh, who appeared at trial, unfortunately. Uh, we were all very disappointed about that. Um, but um, uh, my client, Miss Kogan, uh, was the defendant, and Nick Martin, who was her ex partner, was the claimant, both of who uh, appeared at trial and gave evidence. Now, Nick Martin brought, he was the claimant in this case because he brought proceedings first, but actually he was what could be seen as the defendant because he um, was seeking a declaration of uh, sole authorship um, and uh, sued Miss Kogan for that, who in turn counterclaimed for a declaration of joint authorship and infringement of her authorship. Uh, sorry, of her copyright. Um, and she not only counterclaimed against Mr. Martin, but she sued the relevant film companies as part of a Part 20 uh, claim. Um, now, uh, the key element of the case and, and one of the many parts, I think, which make the film, um, uh, well, the film interesting, but also the, the, the background interesting, um, is the film and the screenplay was the creation of two people who worked together as part of a, a, a very collaborative process in their relationship. And you get this from um, all three of the, uh, the, the judgments I'll be dealing with today. 
um, what you had was a struggling, what we say was a struggling, struggling English writer um, and his girlfriend at the time, who was an opera singer, um, uh, quite a talented uh, opera singer. And together they created uh, a number of uh, collaborative works um, throughout their relationship. Um, this was the only one that took off. This was the only, only one that was relevant for the purposes of, of, of the court of the judge. But the background was relevant in the context of um, showing that they had been working together. Um, so what we had was essentially a he said, she said case, where he said, I wrote everything, and she said, I wrote some of it. Um, and what that raised, obviously, was um, issues about the evidence and the importance placed on both the oral evidence, but the written evidence and the documentary evidence, because the only two people who were there at the time were the two of them. Um, so there was no third witness who could assist. Um, and unfortunately, in this case, for my client, um, they were both working off of uh, according to her, um, the same laptop uh, and the same document. So it wasn't a case, they were living together. So it wasn't a case where um, you have two persons who are not living together or are not in a relationship and are working in separate offices and sending each other drafts. Here you have two people who are living together, working together, um, living and breathing all of the works that they're working on, typing um, uh, the, the creation of whatever they've discussed together or separately, but in the same uh, laptop and document. So in terms of documentary evidence, um, the difficulty was we didn't have uh, a, a paper trail of uh, the different drafts um, and the contribution to those different drafts. So it really was a who is lying and who is telling the truth in this case. Now, the reason I raised that right at the outset is because um, to me, this was one of the most interesting and important aspects of this case because it um, was something that the judges really needed to grapple with at the extent to which they could take into account the different parties' accounts, lies, the truth, the live evidence, and the documents that supported that. So you'll see this thread of how the evidence has been dealt with throughout um, my talk today. Now, there were a number of drafts that were an issue, um, and this is also something that is quite important. Um, what uh, what we had pleaded was that there were, I think, nine drafts from memory, three of which, no, four of which um, Miss Kogan had been very heavily involved in because she moved out after the, I believe it was the fourth draft uh, or maybe the sixth draft draft, but she had been very heavily involved for quite a large amount of time. Um, uh, living together. And then when she moved out, her involvement was more limited, mainly because of her being cut out of the process. Um, and when the final draft, which I believe was draft nine, was finalized, she wasn't involved in that process at all. Now, the reason that became important was because there was an issue as to whether the copyright was in the final draft of the screenplay and whether she needed to be a joint author of that final draft, or whether it was in the project as a whole, the, the, the copyright in all of the work, so drafts one to nine. Um, in, in reality, it didn't really matter because if she was a joint author of the third draft, for example, um, only, then she could have still sued for infringement um, of any later drafts because um, uh, those carried through them the contributions that she had made to, to the, the earlier drafts. And that was what we in fact pleaded was that she was a, a joint author of the work as a whole, um, which was the creation of the screenplay as a whole, including all drafts. Um, but in any event, um, they, have, they had infringed by creating later drafts, which were based on earlier drafts. Um, so we covered all bases on, in, in the pleadings. Now, this was a big point of contention um, because at the case management conference, which uh, for, the, for those of you who don't know, it's the um, procedural hearing that occurs after the pleadings have closed in, in, in any case. Um, and in the IPEC, the Intellectual Property Enterprise Court, where this case took place, um, the CMC is extremely important because the IPEC is a venue that provides 
uh, a very uh, streamlined approach to litigation to enable parties, um, SMEs, individuals to be able to take their cases to trial um, without spending hundreds of thousands of pounds. Um, and the streamlining process takes place right from the outset because um, parties need to set out their case in a very detailed way in their pleadings, more so than if you're in the high court. Um, and by the time you come to the CMC, all parties need to understand exactly where they are on the issues, the arguments that are being run, so that the evidence can then be streamlined and the arguments can be streamlined so that the whole thing fits in two days, which is um, quite extreme in, 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 in most cases, but particularly in, in a case like this. So the reason why the CMC was quite important in this case was because at the CMC, the film company's council raised this issue about whether the, um, the co the joint authorship needed to be in respect of the final draft or whether it needed to be in respect of all of the drafts as a whole. Um, and what we had raised was um, the fact that she was relying on earlier drafts, that there was a case for infringement and actually it was um, everything as a whole. Uh, the judge actually, he indicated to us after this discussion that our interpretation was right, which was if the final draft has elements of earlier drafts that she had um, had significant input in, um, then that was enough for copyright infringement and it didn't have to be the final draft. And that was crucial because it meant that all parties approached the evidence and the arguments at trial on, the base, on that basis. So all of the evidence that was prepared related to earlier drafts of the, uh, both of their input in earlier drafts of the screenplay um, and, and later drafts and showed um, the, the, the way in which the final draft of the screenplay in um, included um, elements that she said she had, had, had significant input in relation to. Um, now, this uh, went slightly pear-shaped at the first trial because um, counsel for the claimants who hadn't been at the CMC raised what we call the knockout point, which was, um, in order to uh, be a joint author of the final draft, you need to have been a collaborator in that draft and therefore um, uh, we cannot win because she was not a joint author of the final draft. Um, that was an argument that wasn't pleaded. It was an argument that was already raised at the CMC and that was rejected. Um, and it was raised for the first time in the skeleton argument of counsel. And unfortunately, it was something that the judge actually liked and, and, and listened to and found in favor of. Um, but he, he obviously went on to, to, to discuss a lot of joint authorship and, and some of her contributions. So that was the first, uh, uh, we'd say, um, flaw and issue and, and the first basis of our appeal um, was this, this, the, issue, the issue we took with this knockout point. Um, the, the second uh, major um, flaw, let's say, in the judge's reasoning was um, related to the way in which the evidence was dealt with. Now, as I said before, both um, Ms. Cogan and Mr. Martin were witnesses. Uh, both of them gave um, uh, lengthy cross-examination evidence on, 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 their, on their case. Um, and what the judge found was that neither of them were liars, uh, but that he, he, he didn't need to, uh, because of the um, passage of time between the events and, and their evidence, he relied on a case, the Guestman and Credit Suisse case, which um, essentially says where there's a, it deals with the fallacy of, of um, witness evidence where there's been a long amount of time passed between the evidence and, and when the events took place. And in those circumstances, the courts can look at documents, contemporaneous documents, to try and um, put together uh, the, the, the picture. Um, his Honor Judge Hakon took it a little bit too far um, and only relied on the documentary evidence and not the oral evidence that had been provided or, or the, 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 the the evidence and the witness statements. But in doing that, he only relied on the evidence that supported the claimant's case. So it wasn't a well-rounded review of the evidence, looking at both sides and, 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 and coming up at, a, at a, a decision. He quoted and relied on documents that supported only one side, uh, one party's case. Um, he, he obviously dealt with the law of joint authorship and a number of other issues, which I won't go into, um, it, it's um, an interesting judgment, 
Um, and it's worth a read if you're interested in, in, in the, the Kogan saga um, to, to understand the Court of Appeals decision. Um, but there were, we say, a, a number of issues um, with that judgment. Now, that led us on to the appeal, which was, which was an interesting uh, appeal to say the least. We had appealed obviously on a point of law, which is the only um, way in which you can appeal. We were given permission to appeal on that basis and it was on the judge's um, uh, errors in, the, uh, in respect of the joint, um, sorry, the law of joint authorship. That was the, the, the general issue we had. And we had an issue with the, um, the knockout point um, that was raised. But we thought that the way in which the court had dealt with the evidence was uh, so wrong that we also had grounds relating to how that evidence had been dealt with. And we didn't get permission in relation to those specifically, but um, the, the, the Court of Appeal said if, if he was wrong on the, the, the law, then obviously the assessment of the evidence may be wrong as well. So it, we weren't um, barred from, from raising those issues. Um, so uh, I, it was myself, um, my leader, Simon Manless QC, and obviously Lionel, um, all three of us were in the Court of Appeal. Um, I thought it was fascinating um, because uh, in a sudden turn of events, the Court of Appeal were very interested in the issues with the evidence. Um, obviously we spent a lot of time on the, the law and why the judge was wrong, um, but they wanted to be taken to the, um, the documents which we say supported our client's case. Um, and there was a very long annex um, called Annex A, which was a, uh, a detailed account by Ms. Kogan of all of her contributions to the, to, um, to the scripts um, and the, uh, the way in which it made its way into the final version. So it was a very detailed account, it was a fair and honest account which the, um, the judge at first instance had said was, uh, was rambly, so he didn't take it into account. Um, and the Court of Appeal were very interested in this, so we obviously took the opportunity, uh, Lionel might remember, uh, of showing them all of the bits of evidence which supported our client's case um, and, and, and all of the documents. Um, and when you, when you read the Court of Appeal's dis, uh, decision, it, it, it is very interesting in the sense that they obviously deal with the, the law and the law of joint authorship. And it is now the leading case on joint authorship. So if you ever have um, any cases dealing with that, that is the place to go. And I won't get into the detail of it. I could spend another hour speaking about that. Um, but it does set out in detail the uh, law of joint authorship, what is required, um, collaboration, contribution, et cetera. Um, but more interestingly, in my opinion, um, they also go through the evidence um, that was not taken into account by the judge and comment on that evidence and say that in their view, it was evidence that showed that there was a significant contribution on the part of Ms. Kogan. Um, but the problem they had was, one of the many problems they had, and you'll see that from the judgment, but one of the main problems they had was that the judge at first instance had not made findings, fundamental findings of fact um, and with, in the absence of those fundamental findings of fact, it was not possible to determine the issue of collaboration, which is the first limb. There needs to have been a collaboration between two people um, and the subject, of the, the, the fruits of the collaboration has, um, uh, has to be a significant contribution. So they weren't able to answer the first question because there were no sufficient findings of fact. On, on that, that needed to be determined. Um, but they did give their view on some of the, uh, the, the types of contribution that had been given. So they were left with no choice, it seems, but to order a retrial, which um, is extremely rare in, in general, but especially in IP cases for a retrial to be ordered. Um, and I think it was much to my surprise that a retrial was ordered because we thought we'll have win or lose. Um, so it was obviously a positive, uh, uh, um, it was a victory, um, but obviously for clients who are in the IPEC because it's meant to be a cheap streamlined um, uh, venue, uh, don't want to have to do the trial all over again uh, and spend the money of having to do that. So 
Um, it was a, a, a win, but uh, obviously we all had to go back and, and fight it again. So I recommend that everybody um, read, if you haven't already, read the Court of Appeal decision. Um, in particular, um, there are a number of points I find very interesting. One is that um, the Court of Appeal deal with the type of work a screenplay is. They said it was a dramatic work. And because it's a dramatic work, um, there are, it isn't just the wording that, or the, the, the words or the, 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 the wording or the letters that is going to be important. There is plot characterization, um, the, the selection of historical facts and putting them in uh, and dramatizing them. All of those become very important in a screenplay because those are the things that um, the authors will be putting together to interest uh, the audience. So it is very important to bear in mind when you're looking at copyright cases to bear in mind what that work is um, and, 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 and uh, what is going to be um, original and important um, when looking at that work. And so I found that to be quite an interesting um, discussion about screenplays as, as dramatic works because it really informs the rest of the assessment. Uh, when looking at the, the the types of contributions that the parties have made. Um, the second is obviously they, they revisited the law of joint authorship and, and it's now the leading case on joint authorship. Um, the third was that they dealt with the, the, uh, the Guestman case point. Um, uh, and what they said was um, that essentially, uh, the Guestman case does not set out a general principle that you can just rely on documentary evidence. And I'll read, read the, bits of the paragraph that they, um, where they deal with it. They say, it is one of the line of distinguished judicial observations that emphasize the fallibility of human memory and the need to assess witness evidence in its proper place alongside contemporaneous documentary evidence and evidence upon which undoubted or probable reliance can be placed. So that's in the first instance that these cases talk about where there might be an issue with human memory because of the, the, the passage of time. You can look at contemporaneous documents in the round um, uh, as part of that assessment. But then what they went on to say was, a proper awareness of the fallibility of memory does not relieve judges of the task of making findings of fact based upon all of the evidence. Um, heuristics of mental short or mental shortcuts are no, no substitute for this essential judicial function. In particular, where a party's sworn evidence is disbelieved, the court may say why that is. It cannot simply ignore the evidence. You can't, so in, in essence, what they said is, you cannot just rely on the documents um, without considering the actual evidence. You need to say, I, the, the, the witness said this, and here's a document that, that goes against that, and I prefer the document because maybe the witness misremembered. Um, and what the judge had done at first instance is to say, I don't need to consider the evidence. Um, I, I can just rely on these, on these documents. And um, that cannot work in a he said, she said case because you have some significant conflicts of evidence. You have one person saying a discussion had place on this and another person saying that discussion never happened. So you need to find that someone was lying um, or that someone has misremembered um, uh, to be able to make a finding of fact, and that just wasn't done. So the Court of Appeal um, reminded everyone of, of, of the principles of uh, Guestman and how documentary evidence can and should be taken into account. Um, another point was obviously they heavily criticized um, the judge's assessment of the evidence, stating that he failed to make fundamental findings of fact, which I've already said. Um, and then they um, provided some interesting commentary on the documents. So uh, they then ordered the retrial. Now, the retrial, which was um, probably even more interesting than the Court of Appeal, um, was done by myself and my colleague, uh, Beth Collett, um, who, who I was leading. My, my leader couldn't do it um, anymore and because of conflict. Um, so it was just myself and, and Beth. And one would think, oh, because you've done the case once before, it's easy, you can just do it again. Um, it, it was probably one of the hardest trials I've ever had to do, and I've had some pretty hard trials. The reason being, and this is what is quite interesting about retrials, is um, 
you you have to be aware and familiar with what happened in the first trial in terms of the evidence because um, that evidence in the witness box is not evidence on the second trial. The trial is started afresh. So the judge will look at it afresh, but you need to know what has been going on to be able to know whether the witness has been inconsistent, to know whether the case has been put differently. So um, it, it, you end up having to know double um, than, than what you, you, you needed to before. So it was very intense. Um, even the judge, I think, said it's essentially a two-week trial that was squashed into to three days, um, which, was, which was very tight. But it was interesting. The two reasons why it was very interesting. One was the witnesses, and you'll see from the judgment from, his, um, from Mr. Justice Mead, were both um, said to be poor witnesses. And the reason I would say they were poor witnesses is because they'd done it before. They'd done it once. They knew what the, the questions were. They knew what the evidence was. So they were both very ready for it and very argumentative. Um, and the judge, um, uh, he deals with that, which I'll come on to, but um, it, it, it ended up being worse than, than better. Um, uh, another reason it was interesting is because um, it was a lot more narrow in many ways because everybody knew what the law was, the Court of Appeal had dealt with it. Um, but um, you, you had to um, put certain propositions that had been put before and remind the witness of their evidence. So it ended up being a little bit convoluted, but we got there in the end. Um, now, what I found to be the most interesting part of the very long 400, over 400 paragraph judgment um, was the way in which the judge dealt with the evidence. And obviously he dealt with the issues of joint authorship, collaboration, contribution, which is, which is interesting, obviously, from a legal point. Um, but what he, he did deal with was um, issues where you have um, witnesses in the witness box which, may have, which have been found to have lied in respect of certain aspects how that has a knock-on effect on the rest of their evidence, or where they have evidence from the witnesses, um, which is, doesn't really stack up, but the documentary evidence does. And I think he dealt with it extremely well for a number of reasons. First of all, he, he clearly didn't like the witnesses very much, um, but he deals with the evidence of the witnesses halfway through the judgment. And usually what you get in judgments are a little bit of an introduction, and then you'll, you'll have a discussion from the judge about the witnesses and whether they were good witnesses or bad witnesses and then what they gave evidence on. And he specifically says, I'm, I'm dealing with the witnesses later on because I don't want it to detract from what is actually more important in this case, which is essentially the documentary evidence, the contemporaneous um, evidence. He didn't want the fact that their, their witness evidence in the box the fact that it was bad to, to be the focus point. So he deals with it later. Um, what he then did was he, he, he obviously considered the, the Guestman case. Um, and he held that because the, this case involved two private individuals living together, um, he noted that it was unlikely that the details of the interactions were going to be um, recorded in any documents, which is what I, what I, what I explained at the beginning. Um, but he said that there were other documents that were very useful, um, which could be used to assess their working relationship. And just to put it into context, the type of documents that we're talking about here are, um, Ms. Kogan spent um, some time in the US, she was a, 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 a American and um, had been spending some time there. And she and Mr. Martin had been communicating over Skype um, a lot. And you see a chain of communication where um, you have a conversation that happens over the phone because you can see a Skype a call for an hour. And then um, an email exchanged where he sends her the e an email with the, 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 the script right up and says, let me know what you think. Um, she'll say, okay, great on Skype. I'll have a look. Um, an hour passes and she'll say, let me call you. And she calls him. And then they have a little bit of a conversation on Skype um, where uh, they discuss some pretty fundamental points about it. And he says, great, I'll, I'll write it up. And then he'll send her another email. So when you 
patch all of this together, you start to get a, a, a picture of what was going on behind the scenes at home as well as when they were apart. Um, and that was the kind of, uh, those were the kind of documents that were relevant. What you do also get is um, we got emails with um, Ms. Kogan and um, the relevant people at the production company um, about the music uh, that was being used and how it was important for the character. Um, and it showed a real understanding from her about the character plot, how it all interweaved into the story. So those were the kind of documents that were relied upon. Um, and those were the kinds of documents that the, the, the judge found to be helpful to show what was going on behind closed doors when there were no documents. Um, what he did find was, um, he concluded that just because a witness is lying on an issue does not mean that the entire of the evidence, entirety of the evidence needs to be rejected, well, which is very important because you can um, carve out that bit, um, not always, but it may be that they'll be lying on something in particular, um, but um, it doesn't mean that the rest of it is, is a lie. And uh, an example in this case was Ms. Kogan had said she had written a lot of the, um, the text in the laptop side by side, that was her case. Um, and he rejected that case and said she was lying. He didn't like her evidence in the box. But just because she, he found that she was lying on, on um, the fact that she had written bits of the, 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 the actual screenplay in the laptop didn't mean that she hadn't had any other input. So he, he um, carved that out. The second conclusion was, he said, it should be borne in mind that a witness may lie to bolster a true story or to try to bolster a false one. Um, so they, the, lying doesn't mean that the whole story is, is false. You can lie because your story is true and you're just um, uh, supporting it a little bit more. Um, but um, you can also lie to support a false story. So the, the, just the, the principle of lying in itself is not, um, not the end of the world. And the third point was a witness's evidence may be wholly wrong without them having lied. Um, their recollection may be distorted by reinterpretation of what, have ha what, have, what had happened or even delusion. Um, uh, and the reason why we thought this was quite interesting was because he found that Mr. Martin hadn't lied. Um, but our submission was he was so deluded about what had happened that he truly believed what he was saying. So he wasn't lying. Um, in the sense that that was his recollection of what had happened, but that recollection was wrong. Um, and that was the interesting difference between our case and their case, which was we had to prove, um, because Mr. Martin's case was he had written all of it, all we had to prove was that he did not write all of it, that she could have written some of it. And at that point, his whole case crumbles. Um, and we did not prove, need to prove that he was lying because um, he, uh, he may have misremembered the whole thing. So his whole story is, is based on delusion. So we didn't pitch it at, at, at that level. They had to prove that she was lying because her evidence was so detailed on the level of her contribution that they needed to prove that every single bit that she had, um, that she had, um, or, or a lot of it was, was a lie. Um, but they didn't, they didn't, um, weren't able to prove enough of it was a lie. Um, so, so from my perspective, um, that was the, the, the really interesting part of the case. Um, he then went on to find that um, Ms. Kogan was a joint author. There was a, a, a collaboration. Um, she had made a significant contribution. That contribution was 20%. Um, uh, and that um, the film companies had not infringed, and that was a, due to the stopper point, which is was kind of its own sideshow, which I won't get into the detail, but essentially um, they found that because she hadn't asserted her right when she could have, they relied on that lack of assertion and, and, and therefore she was stopped from, prevented from um, uh, later complaining about their infringement, but they were now ordered to pay um, um, royalties going forward and, and, and had to credit her on IMDb as a, as a joint author. So, so where does this leave us in, 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 in terms of lessons learned and, and the whole saga? Now, um, it's important to bear in mind that when you are dealing with cases of joint authorship, 
um, the story can matter um, just as much as the documents. Um, and the documents can matter just as much as the story. So um, you can often get cases with joint authorship where you'll have two friends who, who write a song together or, and, and they're just doing it in their bedroom or doing it in their studio. And they're both singing, one person's writing lyrics, one person is singing, one person's writing the music down um, and nobody actually has a record of it. Um, that will be a he said, she said case. And sometimes documents can help um, sometimes they can't, and so you end up uh, having to prove that one person is lying or, 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 or not. But most of the time, those are the cases of joint authorship that occur that I've seen, which can be very difficult. Um, and it's interesting to see how the courts deal with those kinds of cases and, and take into account the relationship and the background and the, the nature of, of, of how they've worked and, and, and other documents that might support or not support uh, one case or the other. So. It, to me, showed uh, it was a, a, a nice advancement um, in, in, in the, the law of joint authorship because it, it really shows how the court can um, take into account uh, these kinds of background, background issues. Um, one thing that I thought was quite interesting was in the Court of Appeal, we had um, uh, two, one judge who was quite clearly a, an opera music fan. Um, so he, 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 he he quite, uh, he understood the milieu, which was great. But we had a family law judge, which I found really, really interesting because some of the questions he asked um, was about um, the kind of family side of things and, 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 and relationships. And I think the other side at one point it made a submission that, oh, she's just his ex-girlfriend. Um, she's just helping out as an ex-girlfriend. And the judge said, just because you're someone's ex-girlfriend doesn't mean that um, they just can, that they work for free and that you can just take their work. Um, so it, you have to take into consideration joint, when joint authorship, the wide, the bigger picture, which is very important. Um, the, 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 the second lesson to learn is for any of you who um, end up ever litigating in the IPEC or, or anywhere, but particularly in the IPEC, you need to plead out your case from the outset and you need to raise issues at the case management conference. It's extremely important because now with this kind of judgment from the Court of Appeals saying that you cannot run knockout points at trial, um, your case strategy is even more important now at the outset. And, and you learn case strategy from university all the way through bar school, through, um, you know, pupillage or training, whatever. And you always think, okay, I'll do my case strategy. But it is so crucial because you need to know what your knockout points are at the beginning and you need to plead them and you need to run them and everyone needs to be on the same footing. Um, so, so that is a, a very important point. Um, and uh, the, the third thing I would say is perseverance because um, the, the difficulty we had was um, Miss Kogan was branded as the crazy ex-girlfriend who just wants a bit of money. Um, and she uh, was um, uh, vilified um, by, um, by a lot of commentators and a lot of uh, articles because of uh, after her first loss. Um, and it was um, very important for us to take this all the way because we obviously um, believed in her story and, and it was nice to see that she got um, vindicated and that um, the Court of Appeal really addressed it um, in the right way. And so did um, Mr. Justice Mead, we say, of course. So, um, so always uh, never judge a book by its cover and, and always um, uh, persevere, obviously, if you think the merits are on your, on your side. If you don't, then I wouldn't recommend persevering because uh, you could end up in the position of Mr. Martin. Um, so those are all the points I wanted to make on Kogan. I haven't gone into um, the legal side of joint authorship, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions on that if anybody has any questions. Um, and, um, that's all I have to say. Thanks for listening. Ashton, thank you very much for that. My pleasure. One problem with these um, with these webinars type things is you don't hear the round of applause. Uh -huh. um, but uh, let me give you a, 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 an honorary round of applause. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed that. And it's, it's great to listen to an account of the case that focuses so much on the evidence. I'm, no doubt it comes naturally to somebody who's been closely involved in, in the evidence. 
Um, I wanted to ask a question. We're, we're going to move to a general Q&A where everybody will be on screen or available on screen in a second, if, if, if not already. But I thought I'd start off and ask you a question about, about sure. framing. And in some ways, you know, the case is, is interesting because it is a, a, almost like a, a quasi-marital situation. They were together for a reasonably long time, living together, etc. And as you put it, some of it was presented as her being a bitter, crazy ex-girlfriend. Um, but there's a way in which the case is also rather conservative. And that's because she was an opera singer and a trained opera singer. And I wondered whether how far you thought she wins because she's the person with expertise and she could demonstrate that she had expertise that was relevant to this production. Well, I, I suppose the important point about her expertise um, was that she, because of her expertise, and, 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 and this was a thing that um, we had to be slightly careful about because obviously she was the opera singer. So had the technical expertise when it came to music and what we called characterization through music. So uh, I, I, you obviously um, know a lot about it and saw the film and everything, so you'll remember it, but mm -hmm. there's the, the when, when Meryl Streep is singing and she's being taught by her, um, by her instructor and he's making all of these jokes about you've never sounded better or use, use, raise a soft palate. All of that was going to be obviously her because she had that expertise. She was able to make that funny. And those were the really funny bits of the, of the film. But there was so much more that she contributed to that went beyond her expertise as an opera singer. And what we did, and you may have remembered, was we obviously focused on that because that was easier for us to prove that she with that expertise was obviously going to contribute to those elements, but she also contributed to the characterization of Florence and her personality and other characters and other elements that were used. And once we could get over the hurdle on, 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 on expertise because of, uh, sorry, on things that were relevant to expertise, it was easier to prove other elements that she, she was involved in. Um, so I'd say it helped in the sense that um, it was, a tool by which we could use to show that, to demonstrate that. Um, it was also in some ways a downfall because the, everyone was pushed to try and narrow it just to, to things that she had that expertise on. Um, but it, it kind of it, it kind of went round and round because it is because of that expertise and her ability to, to understand that, that she made the screenplay great. Um, and it's because of the expertise we could show that. So that was a very long-winded way of saying, mm. yes, it was relevant, but it wasn't everything. Um, and, and we use that to our advantage, I think. Yeah, there was a, there was a case in, um, I can't remember, maybe it was in the 70s or 80s, called Godfrey's and Lee's, which yeah. was a, a musical joint authorship case where uh, there was a band called Barclay James Harvest and... The claimant had come in late to this band and helped add some bits to the songs. And one of the reasons why I thought he was successful in that case was because he was a trained musician and he'd come into a, an environment where the other musicians were untrained. And that really helped his case that he'd, he'd had mm. these important components. Um, so, and that's why I mean, in some ways it's conservative. Yeah. Um, I mean, anybody feel free to stick your hand up and ask questions. Otherwise, I'll continue asking Ashton some, some other questions. Um, I, I wondered whether uh, you would say something about the framing of the quantum, the 20%. What, what, yes. was, what, were, what was your argument and did the judge just accept it? And, and... <laughs> no, no, our, that was a very difficult part of the case. The, the level of contribution, because we were relying on everything that was in that Annex A. When that Annex A had, I'd say at least 50% of it was, no, about 50% of it we, we said was, well, it's difficult to know because, and I'll put it this way, if you have a, a skeleton argument that is written by counsel, 
um, you can pick up the words that are written by each and then figure out what percentage is going to be attributable to one or the other. Um, but let's say council comes up with an argument that is the killer argument, um, but doesn't actually write much of the words. It's the other council that writes the, the words. That killer argument is crucial to what goes into that. And, and a lot of the input that she had was very significant in terms of impact. Um, and the difficulty in, in, in trying to quantify what that is, um, particularly where you only have three days to prove it. If we had a two week trial, we would have gone through every scene and, 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 and proved that she had input on every scene and, and every plot and, and, and how that was relevant, but we couldn't do that. So what we said is you can extrapolate we gave six examples of where she had contributed. We were, we were successful on all six. Um, and then we said, you can extrapolate that to, to other scenes. And the judge said he, he couldn't do that because it, 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 it's an assessment that is just, impo it's impossible. Um, so it was a very much a stick a finger in the air and get a feeling of how much she contributed. A lot of it, the screenplay writing is going to be about the actual writing of the screenplay, the structure, which is gonna have a significant impact as well. Um, we said the way you should do it is to split it 50 50 like in a divorce okay so we we said um i don't think we relied we were thinking about relying on some divorce cases and we thought this is getting a little bit too wild but we 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 started to rely on the kind of tenants in common cases and and mm -hmm. um and say if you can't figure it out you've got to go 50 50 because it's difficult to split that that input uh, and uh, without rereading the case, um, he, he didn't like that argument and he just he just came up with what he thought was a fair a fair amount, um, which was 20 percent. And and obviously we think that it, that was less than what she contributed um, and they think it's more than what she contributed. So, you know, it, 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 it is what it is. And because it was all based on factual findings, it's very difficult to appeal that kind of decision. Um, but it's it's near impossible to try and work out what that contribution is. And he asked us all for our submissions and we made them, but all, you know, with kind of hypotheses and concepts. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I think anything, when it comes to contribute to the split, it's a very, very hard assessment. Okay. And, and um, I don't see anybody raising their <laughs> hands yet. Oh, wait a sec, we have two hands raised. Oh, we have a, yeah. we have a hand. 